All right. So now that we've had kind of a brief uh, introduction into the failure of glass and the mechanisms that, that occur, uh, I want to focus our attention on how we can actually strengthen glass. All right, so before we begin, um, let's, uh, what I want you to do is kind of brainstorm and list some ways that you think that glass can be strengthened. So these are maybe techniques that you are aware of or just general ideas uh, that you think will strengthen a glass. So take a minute, uh, fill this out in the quiz, and then come back and I'll sort of share you uh, share with you the list that I have. All right, so let's take a look at some of the ways that glass can be strengthened. And so I have a list here. Again, um, I'm providing the list here, but this is not necessarily the only things that can be used. This is just a, a list of some of the things that we're going to talk about in this lecture. So um, there's going to be seven that we talk about, and uh, probably only six. I, I don't think we'll talk much about glazing and, and coating. Uh, but uh, the first one is proof testing. Uh, so this will take a little bit of explanation, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get to that. Uh, and then the formation of fibers or whiskers. Um, we're going to then also talk about uh, process conditions, so how we can remove bubbles uh, in uh, molten glass. And then we're going to go on to thermal tempering, ion exchange, and the formation of glass, ceramics, and also there's glazing and coating. So let's go through this kind of one by one. So let's first look at proof testing. And so this is a bit gimmicky, I, I, I will admit, uh, but uh, this is basically a method that relies on the statistical approach that we take to test ceramics. And that's uh, the uh, sort of Weibull distribution. And so this is kind of a Weibull curve. And we're actually going to talk about this uh, in uh, a couple modules to come. Uh, so uh, you know, if you're not, if you don't know everything about it, that's 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 fine. But basically, the idea is um, ceramics um, can break at pretty low stress values um, if they have a flaw at the right position or a flaw that's very large. And so it can break at very low um, conditions. And so basically, proof testing is basically taking your uh, sample, your, your set of materials that you want to quote unquote strengthen, and it's subjecting it to some uh, predetermined uh, proof testing stress level. So kind of at the low end. And by subjecting it to this stress, all of those that are the weakest samples will just break. Right? And so the ones that are left can survive that stress level. And so by getting rid of these failed components that break at the, the lowest stresses, uh, we're able to sort of weed out those bad samples, and then that makes our resulting um, distribution stronger. And so again, I, I told you it's a little bit gimmicky. It's not actually in, intrinsically strengthening the material. It's just in strengthening a, a sample set. And so, but I just thought I would show you that because this will connect with the Weibull uh, analysis that we talk about uh, coming up. All right, so let's talk about some ways that we can more fundamentally strengthen glass. And the first one I want to talk about is creating fibers or whiskers. So kind of the same thing there. So Griffith, the guy that we talked about that came up with the energy balance in the last module, um, also found that the strength of glass fibers increased when you decrease the diameter. So as the diameter of the glass got smaller and smaller, um, the strength uh, became larger and larger. And so this is basically uh, a plot of that where he shows the tensile strength in gigapascals um, as opposed to the fiber diameter. So up here, at the highest diameters, we see that it's uh, less than you know 0.5 gigapascals, and it stays pretty low under one until you get to about 10 microns, and then it shoots up, and we see that at the very lowest where we're under 10 microns uh, in diameter, the tensile strength is up extremely high, about four and a half gigapascals. So you know many orders uh, better than than the other ones that we have here uh, and so it just drastically uh, changes the the strength and so what i want you to do is another quiz i've got another quiz question for you and um, i want you to think about uh, why does the strength of glass but 
really any brittle material, increase when we decrease its dimensions. So see if you can come up with an idea or ideas, uh, do that in the quiz, and then come back to the video and we will discuss. All right, so what he found is that the Griffith equation that we talked about basically verified the experimental results that he saw with that data set, with the um, the strength going up with decreasing diameter size. And what it really comes down to is this fracture or failure stress is related to the crackling, right? So one over the crackling. So this, the the larger the cracks are, the the less the stress will be, or vice versa. If we decrease the the crack size, this will go up, right? And so that's basically what this is showing us as well. And so by changing the diameter of the glass, so once we get to, you know, if we go back to this, right? Once we're getting this low. What's happening is in a fiber, uh, glass fiber that is, you know, 20, 10 microns thin, um, the flaws in that material can't be greater than 10 to 20 microns, right? Uh, and down here, you know, even smaller. Because if you had a flaw that big in the glass fiber, the fiber would just, you know, be two separate fibers, right? So by changing, by decreasing the dimensions, we don't allow for large crack sizes to occur. And so that's the beauty of uh, making these very fine uh, fibers or whiskers is that we are basically excluding flaws uh, above a certain size. Whereas up here, if you have a fiber diameter that's over 100 microns, you could still have a 20 micron flaw within the material that causes it to fail at a very low um, stress value. So that's that's what we're doing here uh, with fibers. And that's why you see a lot of composite materials using fibers of Kevlar or glass uh, or anything like that, because those have inherently strong uh, tensile strength. All right, so let's look at the next um, region, uh, next kind of way that we can uh, do this. And this is also another kind of uh, way of removing flaws. So by making fibers, we eliminate the possibility of large flaws. And here, uh, in the processing of our glass, um, we need to make sure that we can eliminate uh, pores, right? Any sort of uh, air bubbles, right? So if we have a bubble in a glass, that's going to serve as a flaw. So when we're doing it, um, when we're when we batch the glass, which means you know put the right ratio of materials together, uh, it, they're melted in a continuous furnace. And so I showed some sort of different designs. And so basically, what the continuous furnace does is it has different regions that the glass flows through that have different temperature profiles. And those temperature profiles um, give it different properties and allow for us to remove bubbles in certain ways. And so the, the goal of this is that we can um, increase the, the strength of a material. In this case, I have Al2O3, but you can think the same way uh, with glass, is that the strength uh, goes up um, with the reduction of porosity. So here, down here, is 0% porosity. Whereas if we have a lot of pores, uh, you see the strength goes down. And so that's the same thing. You can just think of uh, pores and bubbles as kind of the same uh, same idea. And so we can get rid of these um, uh, bubbles in glass in a couple different ways. The first one would be related to um, the uh, continuous furnace that we just saw. What we see is if we increase the temperature of a glass material, and we saw this in the previous um, uh, modules about viscosity, is that by increasing temperature, uh, the viscosity becomes, uh, it becomes less vis uh, viscous, and therefore the bubbles uh, will be able to float to the top more easily with less resistance from the viscous, the, the less viscous glass. And so this is kind of according to Stokes' law. By increasing the temperature, we basically increase the dr uh, drift velocity of bubbles moving up through um, 
uh, against gravitational force. So this is kind of the opposite of uh, what we see here. So the viscosity, uh, temperature goes up, viscosity goes down, and bubbles are able to move more freely to the surface and therefore uh, be eliminated from the glass. So that's one way we can increase the temperature. So in that continuous furnace, we can set the profile such that we increase the temperature and remove uh, bubbles from forming. The other way is by adding things that we call fining agents. So something like uh, sodium uh, carbonate, uh, salt, rock salt, sodium chloride, uh, or even uh, arsenic oxide, which is, which is, as it sounds, toxic. Um, but what these do is when these uh, go into a very hot glass, they basically decompose. So they decompose to form CO2 or uh, various gases or oxides um, when they hit that hot glass. And what that does is creates a large quantity of gas. And when uh, a large quantity of gas forms, they form larger and larger bubbles because all the small bubbles sort of coalesce into one. And then that also allows it to move faster because we basically increase the, the radius um, of the particle. So this is the other kind of chemical route in which we can eliminate bubbles by forming more bubbles. It sounds kind of contradictory, but that's one way we can remove bubbles from uh, being trapped in a class.